So I'm glad you're here. I'm Mike Wabacher, the Executive Director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. This is another edition of Thursday Night Live every Thursday at seven o'clock. Uh, from now into the spring, uh, we will be bringing you a, a new program. Tonight, Leave it to Beaver. Uh, actually, we will play with a bunch of titles, uh, Beavers Matter as well, which is actually a website we'll share with you in a second. So I'm glad you're here for a conversation about beavers. We're really thrilled that you're here. Uh, if you're new to the Schuylkill Center, we're really glad you're here with us tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, we are open. Um, the, the trails are really wonderful right now. It's a, it's a winter wonderland. Uh, so we do come, it does not look like this right now. But uh, the visitor center is open. Our trails are open. The visitor center is open on Monday through Saturday. It's closed on Sunday, but the trails are open uh, all day, every day, uh, dawn to dusk. So you can actually park on Hagee's Mill Road. We have a small parking lot. If you come on Sundays and the visitor center is closed. So do come for a walk. Um, as many of you have discovered, time in nature is really a great benefit uh, to the stress of, of pandemic living. So come alleviate your stress by a walk in our forest. Love to have you. I hope you all know we're an environmental education center that offers a full range of environmental education programming of all kinds, including lectures like tonight, field trips. Um, if we ever get back to those again, uh, we also operate uh, a really wonderful summer camp that's been going on for more than 30 years now. Uh, camp is almost full, but if you have a child who'd love to be outside this summer, uh, check out summer camp on our website, uh, schuylcenter.org, which I'm sure you found. Uh, in addition, we operate Nature Preschool. Uh, we're almost full for next year, the next school year. Our Nature Preschool has actually been meeting in person all through the school year. So the outdoors time in nature has been our secret weapon in COVID. Uh, so um, our kids have been meeting and we've been outside. The classes have been outside all day, every day, um, even in the rain. Um, until actually I should uh, modify that in the last couple of weeks, there are a couple of days when it was bitter cold and icy snow and uh, we rearranged the buildings so they could be distanced and inside. Um, but even on those cold days, they spend a portion of the day um, outside. So Nature Preschool, check it out, it's in its eighth year. We operate one of the most successful and ambitious environmental art programs of any nature center in the country. Uh, we have indoor and outdoor exhibitions. This is an exhibition that was um, on the property a few years ago. Uh, that's all made from industrial recycled plastic, like those traffic cones you see um, when highways are being partitioned. Um, the current show is called Citizen's Eye, a kaleidoscope of nature. It's 450 photographs arranged like a kaleidoscope. Um, the response of our members, friends, visitors, staff oh, really? uh, to, to the pandemic, to nature in the pandemic. So check out that. It's both an indoor in our art gallery and it's online, schuylcenter.org slash art. Uh, you can see the, the new exhibition, Citizen's Eye, and that's up through uh, early April. We also operate the only wildlife clinic in the city of Philadelphia, one of the few in the entire region. Here's the director, Chris Strub, um, offering fluids to a red-tailed hawk who was successfully released. And we have a, a, a small campaign to raise money. Uh, you can see this on our website for an incubator. We have human incubators that are hand-me-downs from hospitals for us, some of the baby animals like this baby squirrel that come to us. Um, but we actually are trying to get um, some animal incubators, specific animal incubators, because they have uh, better controls and better humidity, especially. Um, so we're hoping to uh, step away from the, the hand-me-down human incubators and, and uh, move up into ones that are built for animals like this squirrel. So perhaps you consider helping us out. If you go to our website and the rotator on the homepage, you can see how you can participate. Um, we have lots of uh, opportunities for stewardship on our property, like planting trees. We actually are going to be doing some uh, ambitious tree planting during Earth Day, April 22nd. So stay tuned for information about that. Here's two Earth Days ago when we planted uh, a tree with the Phillies, uh, including the fanatic. Um, and that's Scott Palmer, uh, the former sportscaster on the left, who's now the Phillies. Uh, he's in the communications department for the Phillies. So that's that was Earth Day. We're a membership organization. If you're a member, thank you. We appreciate it. So glad you're a member. We appreciate your support. If you're not, consider joining. You get discounts in our gift shop. 
and advance notice on our programs and discounts in those programs. Next week in this series, the rise and fall of our forests from the Lenape to Smokey the Bear. So we'll do essentially the three or 400 year history of Pennsylvania forests in one hour. So we have a forestry professor from Penn State who's going to be joining us, Mark Abrams. Um, so register for next week, the same place that you registered for uh, this one on our website. And then in two weeks, Roxbury, I hope you know, is famous for its toads. Um, the toads will be waking up sometime in late March, probably. It's gonna be a little late this year because the ground is so frozen and cold but they'll wake up from their hibernation and all the toads on the Schuylkill Center's big forest are gonna to wanna to go hopping across Port Royal Avenue and get into the reservoir to mate and lay eggs. And Doug Wexler, um, who's a wonderful nature photographer, uh, a naturalist himself, uh, worked for the Academy of Natural Sciences for many years, uh, has uh, taken some great photographs of these toads and has written a children's book uh, about them, the life cycle of the toad. It's a wonderful children's book, award-winning children's book, and actually several of the photographs were taken at the Schuylkill Center. Um, so the toads in Roxboro uh, are, are famous, kind of like the running of the bulls in Spain. We have the running of the toads. So toads on the road in two weeks, come, come hear that wonderful story and hear how you can be part of Toad Detour. So, but tonight we're talking about beavers and leave it to beavers and we're so glad you're here. So, um, Let's see, let me introduce our speakers to you and set the context for this. Philadelphia was once teeming with wildlife that no longer exist here. Wolves, for example, roamed forest hereabouts before uh, the colonial era when the Lenape inha inhabited this land. So did woodland bison, cougars, elk, passenger pigeons, chestnut trees once dominated our forest, comprising something like one third of all Penn's woods and there were beaver back then too. Beaver are among the many animals that were extir extirpated, became locally extinct following the arrival of European settlers. For many, many years, there were no beaver here in Philadelphia. But wildlife has been resettling Philadelphia. Wild turkeys are long back. Bald eagles and peregrine falcons nest in the city limits. Coyotes have even been seen running down the streets of Roxborough at night. We've seen them at the Schuylkill Center, not as much as I wished. Every so often a black bear wanders through town, one memorably crossed Ridge Avenue only a couple of summers ago. So beavers have returned too. Recently, people have discovered beavers living along the Schuylkill River near Flat Rock Dam, Dam which is very exciting news for people like me, for some of us. So I thought I'd spend an hour with you all talking about this intriguing animal. With me are three guests that the Schuylkill Center is really indebted to for sharing this hour with us. Thank you to them all. Bernard Billy Brown writes for Grid Magazine, is the co-host of the Urban Wildlife Podcast, and is on the Philadelphia Organizing Committee for the City Nature Challenge. He has been following Philadelphia's beavers since he wrote a 2013 article about them for Grid, and he is one of my favorite naturalists, a font of great information. Welcome, Billy. How are you? I'm well. A little slow on the mute, but yeah, good. There Thank you. you are. Great. So glad to have you. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Happy to be here. And let me do a shout out for uh, Grid Magazine. Uh, you can get it in paper. You can get it online. Uh, but, you know, uh, I religiously read Billy's columns. So make sure you get Grid, if only for that. But there's the rest of the magazine is equally wonderful. So thank you, Billy. Suzanne Hagner volunteers with the Bicycle Coalition and Families for Safe Streets, lives in the Wissahickon neighborhood, and is active in the Roxborough Manny Young Conservancy. She helps the Conservancy as a steward of the Lauriston Pocket Park and avidly follows the Roxborough Beaver story. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome. Hi there. How are you? Nice to be here. I'm so glad you're with us. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm, I'm very well. And Chris Muller is a local nature photographer and creator of the website beaversmatter.org a wonderful website, check it out. A project advocating for a peaceful coexistence with beavers. Greetings, Chris. Hi, Mike, thanks for having me. You got it, thank you. Actually, Chris, we're gonna begin with you. You're gonna share your screen and show us some of the photographs uh, of the beavers you've been following um, and sort of give us a, a quick narration of, of that story. All right. Can you see my screen? We can. Great. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Mike. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, my interest in uh, beavers began about uh, three years ago. I was out for a run uh, at the uh, Heinz Wildlife Refuge uh, down by the airport. 
uh, when a beaver crossed the trail right in front of me. I barely was able to catch a picture of it with my cell phone, um, but it was good enough that I, when I went home that night, I could uh, confirm that, uh, see that distinctive wide tail and confirm that it was indeed a, was indeed a beaver. So after reading up about uh, them, I, I came back the next day with a camera and uh, spent a couple hours searching the area for signs of a beaver dam or lodge or even any signs of beaver chewed trees. I didn't see anything initially, um, but then at the, uh, the uh, same, same minute uh, as my prior day's encounter, a beaver came out of the marsh and crossed the trail right beside me. Uh, I waited there a few more minutes and, and a couple more came past. So now this was late spring, um, so I was losing sight of them in the dense vegetation. Um, but once I realized that they had a predictable schedule um, and that I could get some good photos, I um, kept coming back each day in order to learn more. So I'd like to share a few photos from that beaver family. So here first is a uh, close up of the very first beaver that I saw. Um, I would learn that uh, she was the mother of the family uh, when she had kits uh, just a couple months later, early that summer. And um, here's another of her with one of her offspring, about a year old in this photo. Beavers uh, groom themselves as uh, well as each other, as we're seeing in this photo, um, to keep their fur uh, nice and waterproof. And it's actually because of this fur that they were hunted to a uh, near ex uh, extinction a couple centuries ago, as Mike mentioned. There are populations in North America um, prior to um, um, uh, prior to Western arrival were perhaps uh, around 300 to 400 million, and that was reduced to just thousands. But um, fortunately, um, since uh, some fashion changes, beaver hats are no longer in style, and through some legislative action, um, beaver populations have been able to make a comeback in, in recent years. And here's a photo of the kits, uh, so small and just a few weeks old in this photo. Here you see them uh, cautiously venturing up on land for perhaps one of their first times. And uh, here's a photo that I actually shared on my uh, Instagram, uh, Beavers Matter, uh, for Valentine's Day, just a couple of weeks ago. Beavers are monogamous, so they'll mate for life, typically about 12 to 15 years. Uh, and they spend two years uh, raising their offspring before uh, those young go out and venture off on their own to start families. So after observing the uh, beavers at Heinz Refuge for a couple months, I was aware of all the telltale signs to look for and uh, began to spot them in ponds, creeks, and rivers all around the city. Uh, I was particularly intrigued by the, the wide variety of habitats and, and behaviors that I witnessed. And uh, here we can see their work on a uh, tree along the Delaware with the uh, Ben Franklin Bridge in the distance. And uh, this is another, um, just a short distance away there um, by the old uh, Pico Generating Station uh, just next to Penn Treaty Park for those who may be familiar with the area. And then sometimes you get lucky and uh, get to see the, uh, the worker in action. In this close up, you can see how their uh, teeth are actually orange. This is because the outer layer is infused with iron, which of course is very helpful for a life spent uh, chewing into trees. Of course, once you chew through a tree, you have to transport it. And uh, here we see one being uh, brought back to the lodge where the, the bark and the smaller branches will be eaten. Uh, and then larger pieces will be used to uh, reinforce the lodge. So beavers are a, a semi-aquatic species and are much better suited to life in water rather than life on land. Here we can see how the rear feet are actually quite large and webbed. Um, this makes them very adept sw swimmers, um, but slightly awkward on land. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the front feet um, are actually five-fingered, and they're, they're used um, much like we use human hands for eating, uh, carrying, and, and grooming. <laughs> and of course, uh, the urban beaver faces some unique obstacles. Here we uh, see one crossing the railroad track between the Maniunk Canal and the Schuylkill River. At the time, this particular beaver was uh, lodged in the canal right under the boardwalk in, in Maniunk and would routinely make a uh, most unusual three-mile loop uh, in order to feed each night. Uh, of course, beavers are mainly nocturnal, but I joined them on this uh, multi-hour overnight journey on, on more than one occasion. Um, and I'm sure Suzanne will tell you more about the, uh, the, uh, the, these particular beavers in the Medion Canal. So to wrap up, 
one, uh, one rather quintessential aspect of beaver activity that we don't see a lot of uh, in an urban setting is dams. Uh, I've observed their damming of Pennypack Creek up in Montgomery County and uh, Crumb Creek down in Delaware County. Um, but for the most part in more urban settings, um, beavers leverage existing man-made dams and ponds where they already have an adequate water depth and have no need to build dams of their own. However, you, you don't have to travel far to, to see beavers in a more natural habitat. This photo was uh, taken at the uh, Black Run Preserve uh, just over the river in uh, Voorhees, New Jersey. And if you look closely up in the top right, you'll actually see the three lodges um, that, the, that the beaver family lives in right next to their lengthy dam. And here's another nearby uh, showing just how a single dam can create so many acres of pond and wetland habitat. And photos like this show why beavers are known as a quote unquote keystone species. Um, they provide the habitat relied upon by many other mammals, um, as well as countless species of uh, fish, amphibians, and birds. So uh, I'll end there for now, but look forward to uh, taking any questions later. That's really great. Thank you, Chris. Um, you got lots of comments about your photographs in the uh, in the chat, so make sure make sure you read those. Oh, we'll we'll do. Thank you. Yeah, Suzanne. Um, how did you begin to bump into the beavers along uh, the Schuylkill River the, and the River Trail? Um, well, I think it was um, winter 2018. I was uh, riding back from Conshohocken, and I was right below Shawmont, the Shawmont Station. And I noticed a lodge on my, on my, out near the water. Um, so I stopped and um, I was able to see that I could see where there was a, the vegetation had been worn down where the beavers were going up over, back over into the woods. Um, so I knew there were, there were beavers there. Yeah. And I was pretty excited by it. That's great. Um, I, I... Suzanne? Suzanne, if you can hear me, you've been dropping out and dropping back in. Again. Yeah, you're yeah. having a hard time hearing you. So um, one possibility is you'd sign out and try again. Yeah. Hey, Billy, can I turn to you for a second? Go ahead. So you oh. first discovered that there were beavers in the city of Philadelphia like way back in 2013. So you're an okay. early adopter. Um, I guess so. Yeah. I, 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 um, hang on, Suzanne. Okay. Suzanne, why don't yeah, you mute yourself ahead. for a moment, and then we'll come back to you in a, in a minute or two. Okay. Sure. So I had heard about um, yep. uh, beavers uh, taking down trees in the in the Taconi Creek Park in Philadelphia, um, and so the the oh fun intellectually part of the story was that these were trees that were being planted by the water department to help develop the, the forest along the creek um, as part of a forest rehabilitation project. And so the city had spent um, a decent amount of money on some pretty big bore um, uh, oak trees. Uh, and then to the disappointment of the, the, uh, the water department staff, they would came through and just chopped down all the oak trees. Uh, and so you, we, I, you know, I went back out there and I saw that this row of stumps um, where the, the beavers had come in and, and just uh, thank you very much had eaten the, the planting. Um, and so it was, a, you know, it was, and it was one of these things where the people involved were, you know, they were frustrated, but not, um, you know, sort of uh, had a sense of humor about it. Um, and it's, it's one of these tricky things where, uh, where now we have to contend with another landscape architect in the city uh, and it's with its own views of what trees are for. Um, and 
since then, I've it's one of those things where I think Chris has had the same thing happen where once you realize they're there, you start seeing the sign everywhere. Um, and you'll just be on a, a trail along whatever creek or along river and, um, and which, whichever river. Uh, and you'll, you'll see stumps that have been chewed down, you'll see um, trees that have been cut down. Uh, and so it's, yeah, I mean, it, we live in West Philadelphia. Cobbs Creek has its, um, has its own little population of beavers that we've been following. Uh, and so it's, it's something that um, I think it's, it, hopefully what we get out of this is you can walk around and, and look for them yourself. So where would they have come from? How did they come back to the city? And well, I mean, the, they were introduced uh, in the, and I, I, I think I see Jerry check on this call, so I want to make sure I get this right. He's a, a game board for Philadelphia, um, but they were introduced by by game commission of many several states in the east, if I understand this right. And basically, what we were doing is trapping them out west and releasing them in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, and so they would have they wouldn't have been released in Philadelphia. They would have been released in more classically wild places in the state. Um, and they, uh, they just keep spreading. I mean, they spread down rivers, they spread up rivers. I and mean, so if you see them at, at Hines, um, you know that there they are in sort of the estuary, freshwater marsh habitat at the juncture of a couple big rivers. Um, you know, so they can go from, uh, so if you imagine that they were up in the Poconos at some point, it's not so hard to come down the Delaware and then back up to Schuylkill. Um, and then from there, you've got all those creeks to go up into. And so it's just a question of um, over the years with uh, regulated trapping instead of just unregulated trapping, um, they just keep on spreading. And so, yeah, the, the, and when I was talking to the, somebody from the water department at the time in 2013, he was someone who grew up in, um, in Northeast Philly and was saying that uh, he and grew up sort of hanging out, hanging out a lot in the parks. Would have, he, he thought he would have noticed them when he was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, my impression um, is that they, and they, and they were documented in a Fairmount Park biological survey in 1999 as being oh. in the rivers. Um, and so my impression is that, you know, maybe sometime around the 90s, they started getting more established in the Delaware and the Schuylkill, and then from there moving up into the creeks as, they, as each, new fa each new generation looks for another um, stretch of creek to, to build a, a home in. Mm -hmm. um, Ed has a question in chat. And uh, for everyone listening, feel free to add your questions as well, and uh, I'll moderate and ask of our guests. Ed said he was at a pond and saw a beaver slapping the water with its tail many times over and over again. And that's kind of the uh, the quintessential cartoon beaver that you see, the slapping uh, in, in Saturday morning cartoons. Can you explain why this would occur? Um, Billy, I think I'll hand it over to Chris in a sec, but I'll just say that it can be really loud. Um, where I've had it more than once where I've been seeing a beaver swim. And I'm just, I had that moment of like, hey, is that a beaver? And then like, bam, you know, it sort of wakes you up. Um, but yeah, Chris, I think you can probably know more about the, the biology behind it than I do. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. So the, um, the tail slap serves multiple purposes. Um, you'll typically see it described as a warning mechanism to alert other beavers in the area of danger. Um, but um, from a lot of observation, um, one can see it's not solely that. Beavers don't have very good eyesight. Um, they're primarily nocturnal, um, so they're not really adept at, at, at seeing a lot during the day. Um, so they're primarily reliant on smell and sound. So when they sense that there's danger nearby, they can slap the tail in order to try to get a, a reaction um, to identify what kind of predator or danger is nearby and in what direction um, that danger is. Um, so that, that's, that's very common behavior. You'll often, um, especially at dusk, um, you might not even see the beaver. The first sign will be that large, um, you know, slap on the water. Yeah. Um, that will, Which will check, sometimes will means you. they saw you, right? <laughs> right. They will have seen you. In most cases, they will have seen you before you will see them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And for any one of you, um, we have a question from Ellen. Is the reemergence of beavers in our waterways a good sign of the health of these rivers, lakes, and streams? So is that, a, are beavers an indicator of water quality? Chris or, uh, sure. yeah. Sure, sure, I can take it. Yes, yes, that, that is a measure of, um, of good water quality. Um, beavers are very adaptive species, um, but um, uh, obviously um, won't deal well with, um, 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 poorly oxygenated water um, or other pollution sources. 
Um, so yes, that, that's a very good sign that we're, we're, we're seeing them in the area. That's great. And I'll, I'll just chime in and say, Please, it's, yep. it's, it's useful to remember just how polluted Philadelphia's waters used to be. Absolutely. Um, and that in the, you know, in the mid part of the 20th century, early mid 20th century, there was a, like a stretch of, of deoxygenated sort of the dead zone of, of low oxygen water um, in the Delaware that sort of blocked migration of all kinds of fish upstream. And there's just a, it, we, we are, thanks to, you know, modern uh, uh, sewer plants and, and better pollution controls, um, we're really, we're, in a lot of ways, we're seeing rebounding of our waterways um, and the wildlife that use them. And this is a great example of it. All right. So the phrase Schuylkill punch actually meant something very different back in the day when the water was a really weird color. <laughs> yeah. Are there multiple species and strains of beaver? So there, there, there are two. There's a, a North American beaver and a Eurasian beaver. Um, they visually look very, very similar and behave very similar. They do have a different number of chromosomes, so they cannot uh, crossbreed. Um, but um, in North America, as you would expect, we only have the North American beaver. OK. And it's the... And I'd like to point out that uh, about 13,000 years ago, we would have had much larger beavers also. Yes. Um, that when we think of the megafauna that were wiped out at the end of the last ice age, um, I forget the exact size, but sort of like beaver the size of black bear, essentially. Yeah. Um, we're, we're around North America also. Right, right, right. Oh, that's great. And but they did a... not behave like our current beavers. So you didn't, you didn't have these 300 <laughs> pound beavers um, chopping down trees and building dams. Well, trees were bigger uh, back so they then. they were quite probably. different. <laughs> <laughs> and they're rodents. They're one of the largest rodents. Somehow yeah, rodent, I... rodent becomes a pejorative thing that makes us like them less if we know they're well, rodents. It... It's just amazing to see what they can do with their teeth, which is sort of a hallmark of rodents, is having those, is having teeth that just keep on growing and are super powerful. Um, we have pet rats, which are an unrelated group of rodents, but man, they can bite hard. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, I think they're, and I think the other point to make is, is that they're bigger than I always thought they were. Um, I mean, uh, uh, beavers are, I, I think 50 pounds is sort of like, maybe a touch on the large side, but sort of the, within the range of how big they are. So if you think of what does a 50 pound dog look like and think of, I mean, pack it in a smaller package maybe, but they're, they're, they're nice size animals. Yeah. And, and, and beavers are one of the few species that actually continue to grow in size throughout their lives. So that's one of the oh. ways to measure like a three-year-old beaver versus a 15-year-old beaver. Oh, wow. um, the, the 15 year old beaver is likely going to be greater than 50 pounds in size. They can get up to around 80 even, so. Jeez. Suzanne, let's try bringing you in and make, see if the technology is being good to us. Why don't you try to unmute yourself and let's let's see if. Okay. Oh, there you go. Does it sound? Yeah. Okay. There's a bit of a delay, but we'll keep trying. Can you turn your video okay. off? And if there's no video, maybe we'll just maybe the bandwidth will be better for you. So on, on the lower left, you can stop video. It is off. Okay, there you are. Okay. That's so maybe that? that's much better. Good, thank you. Okay. That's so better. Here's, here's okay. my question for you. I, I know that you work with the Rockville Manian Conservancy, and one of the issues that you all mm -hmm. bumped into is you were doing restoration work on the river and did all these tree plantings, and the beavers said thank you and ate all the plantings. Can you tell that story? Well, <laughs> yes. Um, and really the heads of the conservancy, you know, they had been planting trees long before I joined them. And uh, uh, when it first, we first started to find the trees that were cut down, um, you know, it was, <laughs> it was upsetting. I could certainly understand why um, the founders and the, you know, particularly Tom Landsman, Landsman, who has grown all these trees himself. And I mean, this is hundreds of trees that have been planted there. K. Sakura, um, Rich Giordano. I could understand why they were upset about it. Um, I did have a, some experience with beavers prior to being here in Philadelphia. I remembered being on a hike in Northern Vermont, an overnight hike, and we uh, pitched our tent on a pond and it was a beaver pond. 
And it was just wonderful to sit there and watch those beavers just doing their job. And then I knew that they had been reintroduced out in Eastern Washington state uh, where it's so arid um, and where the wildfires have been so disastrous. And that they, I knew that they were bringing beavers in and establishing them there to uh, restore waterways. So I didn't have, um, you know, I, I didn't have the history of planting so many trees here. And I just felt like um, there's something really good about these beavers being here. <laughs> it means the water's cleaner. And there is so much wildlife along the trail. Um, there's seven species of turtles. Two of them are endangered. Mm. Um, you know, that we see fox. Uh, it, it's just, it's wonderful. I think there's really like a wildlife coming back. Yeah. yeah, that's really great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, mm -hmm. Billy, Billy um, you have a lot of thoughts Billy. about how restoration groups can, what, how they can accomplish their restoration work while, uh, while what, while com being compatible with beavers. What's your thoughts for them? What's your counsel? I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, I, I, I'd say I'm not, I wouldn't count myself an expert on this. I, yep. I had conversation with someone at Riverfront North, um, which is where I'm gathering some of this, where uh, Riverfront North is a uh, a group that does develops the East Coast Greenway um, through Northeast Philadelphia, basically. So they they're involved with stewardship for a lot of parks along the river there. Um, and they had been I was doing an article about uh, uh, living shorelines, which is a way of planting up um, shorelines to to deal with erosion using um, using living things like plants. Uh, and so they were they were Easy. they were going through a process of trying out different things um, to see what sticks as plantings along the Delaware, the tidal Delaware. Um, and it turns out beavers really like to eat a lot of the things you plant. Um, but they found uh, that, for example, willows um, bounce back really well after getting chopped down by beavers. Uh, and so you had um, the, the willows had gotten to be, I don't know, like 12 feet tall or something like that. Um, the beaver came along and, and ate them. Um, and yeah, use them for building material also probably, but uh, chop them all down. Um, and then, uh, you know, after a little bit of frustration, they realized the, the willows were sprouting back. They kind of, there's an old term for like coppicing the, the willows where you cut down a large stem and then a bunch of little stems pop up. Um, and I've heard uh, honestly similar story from people who are doing land restoration um, further down the Delaware, like near um, the Walmart, sort of on the water there with, um, a kind of sort of uh, wetland species of dogwood, same thing happened. Um, so, it, so it seems like there are, that that there this is something that we might need to be thinking about more <laughs> as beavers become more dominant in our waterways. Is um, how do we choose species that that bounce back well once um, beavers hit them once and uh, that work right. better into their their diet and that can contend with them better. Right. So for anybody who wants this, uh, Corinne is asking, we have a challenge with stormwater runoff in Southeast of Pennsylvania. Absolutely. Uh, can beaver help us manage that challenge? Uh, she worries that perhaps there's not sufficient remaining habitat. How much acreage does a colony, a beaver colony need to be sustainable? So how much acreage does it need? And then can it help with stormwater runoff somehow? Any, anybody have thoughts on that one for Corinne? Um, sure, sure, I can take it. Yep. Um, it's um, beavers are very territorial um, um, with their own kind. So they will typically, if you have multiple beaver families living in a, in a particular waterway, they're gonna be spaced out maybe a third of a mile or a half mile or so apart from one another. Um, in, in terms of whether that waterway is suitable for beaver habitat, it really comes down to the water level itself as well as their access to trees um, for both food and construction efforts. Um, so it, it, it is, so it can vary a lot by, by, by area. Um, you'll also have beaver families that will move in and could spend their entire lifetime of 15 years in a, um, a single location. In other cases, it might not be an ideal habitat, but it's a suitable habitat. Um, so they'll lodge there for a year, consume all of the available food, and then move on to another location the next year. So, Do you have a sense it. of how they can handle stormwater? Is there any interesting remediation, uh, you know, 
Beavers are, if nothing, good aquatic engineers. I like to rearrange habitat. Um, I've often described, I've often heard them described as the only other animal besides us that rearranges habitats mm -hmm. in that way. Um, so is there a way we can use them to our advantage for, for stormwater? Billy, what do you think? Uh, that's a tricky one. Um, yeah. I think the, with stormwater, um, I don't know that they, I, I'm not sure how, exactly how they would right. affect what we need to do. I mean, with stormwater runoff, your big goal um, is making the landscape more permeable, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to take hard surfaces that water runs off of really fast and replace it with stuff that soaks up water. Um, and so it, it, I'm not sure how a beaver could, let's say, take um, you know, a concrete sidewalk, which is your problem, and replace it with something more absorbent. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, in other, and it's, it's a tricky thing to see how they fit into an urban landscape. I mean, there's, they do fit in. I mean, they do eat, right. they, they live, reproduce, um, carry on their lives well, but they, but the, the, in a lot of, the way I like to think about it is if you're outside of a city, a lot of times your landscapes are much more dynamic. There's a lot more shifting between types of habitat and landscape than you'll see. So you might be in a forest along a stream, the beavers are damming, you know, along the stream at, at different intervals, creating ponds, killing the trees, and then moving on so that that shifts to wetland and then back to forest. And you have this kind of like, and even the streams will like change course over time a little bit. Um, whereas in the city, we, um, it, it, it's not like we're going to give the beaver permission to erase row houses and put in a pond. Um, and the streams are so much more fixed in their courses because we, we, reinforce their banks and everything um, or shunt them underground. So I think it's um, as much as I'd like to give beavers credit for being able to do almost anything, um, I'm not sure what they would do to, to further help um, right. uh, stormwater control. But I'd say that the kind of things we're doing, like the Green City Clean Waters Initiative that the Water Department is doing um, to try to use uh, plantings to soak up more water, um, which has a, a side effect of increasing habitat and green space, I mean, we might be doing things through our stormwater control to help beavers, um, at least right. in that direction. Right. So here's a, um, a story from Jonathan. Chris, I'd love you to react to this. We had a rather frightening encounter with a beaver in Fort Washington State Park where they, her, their kids were enjoying a rope swing that hung below a bridge overhanging on the creek. A beaver came after the kids very aggressively and was literally propelling itself out of the water and lunging at the kids. They were startled at how aggressive it was. Chris, have you seen something like that before? Um, I, I have not. Um, beavers can react aggressively in certain situations, but um, that, that seems to be somewhat uncommon. Um, typically, if you're gonna have an aggressive um, encounter with a beaver, it is going to be in the water. Um, on land, they will flee from you, um, but they are much more comfortable in water. Um, Typically, the run-ins is someone like walking a dog or having their dog go in the right. stream um, and a dog getting bit by a beaver. Um, any interactions with humans? Um, there have been a couple in the Philadelphia area years ago because of rabid beavers, for instance, in, in, in Pennypack Creek about a decade ago. But uh, aside from that, it, it would be very unusual to have an aggressive encounter like that. Now, I wonder if they, wonder if they had babies nearby or something like that. Well, they were too close to a lodge, perhaps? I don't know. Uh, well, and, and, and again, it, they will slap their tail um, yeah. and do a lot of pacing activity and such, which which is is designed to to, to scare the <laughs> to scare the human away. Um, but there, there there's a there's certainly a line between that and them actually coming at you and trying to bite you or having any kind mm -hmm. of direct physical altercation. That that would be very unlikely in an otherwise healthy beaver. Oh, he has a PS. We had to race out of the area as it was abundantly clear. If we stuck around, it would have been gotten quite dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I'll say I've spent a lot of time in in waterways. I can't say it didn't happen. I'm just saying that I've um, I would urge people to to realize that it's pretty rare. I, if it happened, I mean, I I I'd never heard of that kind of thing before tonight, and I have spent a lot of time in the water where there are beavers around um, and. And I've never had, I mean, they've always run away from, from me. <laughs> I don't believe they carry rabies. That wouldn't, they wouldn't be, wouldn't be a rabid beaver. Oh no, they, they could be rabid. I think ah, Chris just mentioned yes. that. Yes. Yeah. We had one in the penny pack a few years ago. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Right. How close would each group family group settle next to another family? Do they regulate overcrowding on their own? 
Uh, yes, I, I think I had, had uh, mentioned a little bit about that, did, but yeah. um, they are territorial. Um, um, so a, a individual beaver family will consist of that mating pair, um, mother and father, and two years of their offspring. Um, typically at around two years of age, they'll move out on their own. So a single beaver lodge um, could house up to about a dozen beavers at the, at the, at the, um, the high end. Mm -hmm. um, so they will tend to keep um, any non-related beavers. Um, they, they wouldn't settle within about a quarter mile or so. Um, in a streamway, and they actually um, use, they create what are known as scent mounds um, in order to mark the perimeter of their territory. And those scent mounds have been shown to not only mark the existence of a beaver occupant, but also the sex of that beaver, as well as whether or not that beaver is uh, looking for a mate. Um, there's a lot of information communicated yeah. um, uh, uh, in, in that scent mound, but um, that's how they kind of amicably um, uh, control their territory. Well, Chris, a surprising theme is emerging from the evening. Kitty writes, we're playing in the Wissahickon. My granddaughter was swinging back and forth on a swing that was over the river when a beaver started jumping out of the water and trying to bite her as she was swinging. They were all paralyzed with fear. They didn't want to hurt the beaver, but began throwing stones to stop it, to scare it. Didn't hit it. She started swimming towards us and then just stopped in the middle of the stream and slapped her tail. We thought maybe we disturbed her nest. So look at that. <laughs> I, 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 I can I only speak from wow. personal experience there. I've spent hundreds of days in the Wissahickon and I'm, I'm very aware of beaver activity. Um, I've never seen or heard of a beaver up the Wissahickon. Um, so not sure what else it could have been, but they don't seem to like swings over right. rivers. They don't seem to like swings over I rivers. <laughs> and I said, the, the Wissahickon is, is one of the most, wow. is the most trafficked waterway yeah. in at least along the banks in Philadelphia. And I think if there were beavers in there, we'd be seeing yeah. a lot more pictures and re reports pop up. Wait, so are the beavers on the Wissahickon? We haven't seen them. I, I mean, I've, I've never there. seen yeah. them or heard of them. And I have specifically on many cases gone to look for any signs of activity. It doesn't look like they've gotten up past the, um, the, right. uh, the dam right out by the Schuylkill River under the uh, train right. bridge. Katie, feel free to tell us where uh, in the chat you saw it. So who preys on beavers? Um, in general, wolves, um, coyotes, uh, bears. Uh, in this area, they don't have a lot of um, yeah. natural uh, uh, predators. It's 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 mainly mainly humans, um, and um, um, lack of available habitat in this area. But they they can. Um, in, in North America, we have beavers all the way from, from Mexico, all the way up into the northern reaches of Canada. The only place in the United States that they aren't found is in Southern Florida um, because uh, beavers don't stand a chance against uh, alligators. So that's the one predator they can't deal with. <laughs> Can beaver lodges be near the bank of a pond? Yeah, yes, they can. They, 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 they can. You have kind of the quintessential beaver lodge, which is this freestanding circular thing out in the middle of a waterway. Um, but in urban areas, it's much more likely to see what's known as the uh, bank lodge, um, where they um, they essentially dig in because the, the beavers need to live above water, but they use the water to protect the entrance to their lodge. So right. if they're going to live in the bank of a stream, they will dig in horizontally underwater and then up toward the surface until they break the surface and then put a, um, um, a wooden lodge uh, yeah. over the top of that. Let's bring Suzanne back into the conversation, Suzanne. So do you know where the beavers are living near near uh, Flat Rock Dam? Do you, do you have a sense of where they are? Um, I think they're above it. There's some above it. <clears throat> I know that. And then I think they're also to the east. Right. Um, I think now when where they are at, in the uh, canal, they're in the um, in the embankments um, right down at Lock at Lock Street. So that's that's where so that they're, they're not building the classic Beaver Lodge in the canal. They're they're in the bank. No. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. When have you seen? Yeah. If you want to right. see them. <laughs> you yeah. don't want to get attacked so it, by them. What, what's your what's your seat? When when should you go? I think it should go around 2 a.m. 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> 2 a.m., right? <laughs> I mean, that's when they've been seen uh, coming across the parking lot down there. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The nice thing, I mean, 
people who are interested in beavers and have experience, when you contact them, they are so willing to give their whole, you know, their whole experience about it. So when I was first trying to get information on the beavers and how we could work with them and uh, have the trees and also have the beavers, you know, I uh, got found some names and sent messages to Skip Lyle in Vermont and he immediately gave me his phone number, call, called me back the next day. Um, I uh, contacted uh, the woman out in California. She was responsive right away, said, oh, you've got a great thing there. Um, and uh, I talked with uh, John Jensen up at, uh, Billy, where you are, and where you've done stories there. Um, and he yes, was helpful. The riverfront north, yeah. Yes, yeah, because we, that's a wonderful place to take a little bike ride to. And uh, it looks wonderful up there now. And he said, just come up and, you know, take some willow. <laughs> but we are getting plugs. We are getting, uh, we're, we're, we're going to start planting for them. Right. We've put up fencing wire fencing we put uh thick cages around the trees i mean we've done everything we can do to save the trees that are there and now we're going to start planting vegetation for them that's great now have you seen them yeah and it wasn't at 2 a.m was it no it wasn't okay at 2 a.m <laughs> but we did uh we, we had a, a consultant come doug noble from Pennsylvania, who's interested in beavers, and he's gone to this beaver uh, conference that's once a year. Um, and he stayed overnight, and he went down at 2 a.m. and got some pictures. So, Chris, you've got some pictures there, and yes. it doesn't look like it was at night. Right. Uh, I, I have I've taken night photos of those uh, beavers in the Manion Canal as well. But um, in, in general, if you want to see them in daylight, um, this is not the time of year to be doing that. Um, May, June, July is pretty much your best window. Um, they, they pretty much have a, um, a consistent circadian rhythm uh, year round, um, about 12 hours up, 12 hours um, asleep. Um, so as the days start getting longer, um, you can see them in a couple hours of daylight, usually coming out around six o'clock or so. Uh, in the winter, you pretty much would have to wait until uh, after dusk. Oh. That's it. So we got a couple of book recommendations. A great book about beavers, says Louise, called Eager, that has chapters about beavers use in environmental restoration. Let the rodent do the work is the motto. And then there's Holly says has a great book by Dorothy Richards who wrote Beaver Sprite about her experiences with beavers in upstate New York. Suzanne, you come across either of those books in your in doing your reading? Uh, yes, that's where I got the uh, the names of people to contact. Um, but there's many books now. Uh, it seems like books keep coming out, right, Chris? I think you have them yes. on your yeah. yeah. On your website, yeah, and if, right. if you go to my website, beaversmatter.org, mm -hmm. and click on the resources section, you'll see a whole library of uh, beaver books out there. Mm -hmm. People should go to the website, uh, beaversmatter.org. Uh, just, if you love the photography, it's just a taste. Uh, just yes. really, really exquisite photography of uh, baby beavers and beavers hugging. And, uh, and Chris, the size of the trees that they take down is remarkable. Yes, yes. It's unbelievable. I mean, these are like monster trees. Yes. Cutting yeah. And, and, and there, there's a lot of misunderstanding around that. People will see the, um, the, the this large, this you know two foot wide tree that the beavers are chewing through and ask, well, what are they going to do with it once they chop it down? <laughs> and um, usually what they're, when they're taking down a large tree, they're not going to use the trunk itself. Obviously, they can't carry yeah. a, a um, um, 500 pound um, uh, a trunk. They're using it in order to get access um, to the, the uh, the smaller limbs and branches, right. uh, and the trunk will get left behind. Mm -hmm. Right. So they cut the tree down just so they can hack off the branches. Wow. That's a lot mm -hmm. of work. What is the gestation period, and what is the size of the litter? Uh, it's about uh, four mm -hmm. months. Um, they will. Um, uh, they should have uh, mated um, in, in this area probably a few weeks ago now. And um, so uh, you'll first see the kits emerging um, from the lodges around here in like May or May or June. Um, 
the uh, the kit size can range anywhere from about one to six, with uh, two or three being the average. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Um, yeah. It's almost five of eight. We're going to go a little past, like ten minutes past eight o'clock. So if you uh, would bear with us, we'd love to have you. We'll go for a few more minutes, and we're going to read a few more questions. We've got a lot of questions coming up. Sandy uh, says, "Shouldn't we respect being in their neighborhood?" <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne, what's your thought to that? <clears throat> I think we should respect being in, but also we have to figure out a way to, I think, to live with them without conflict as little as possible. Um, and that's been, that's been done. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? The philosophical question, they're in our neighborhood, we're in their neighborhood. <laughs> Well, I, I, I mean, I mean I, 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 oh, go ahead, Billy. I was going to say this is something that pops up with a lot of animals. Um, <clears throat> and I say, uh, I mean, yes, we're in, and this is a, yeah, the short answer is yes. <laughs> but um, I think this is a lot of what we're talking about is, is yeah, how do we, um, uh, we have we have inadvertently created, made our neighborhoods more, into, more suitable for their neighborhood. Um, and uh, which is a good thing, and um, yeah, I think it's it, it's good to learn how to how we can how how we can not be put out too badly by what they do and enjoy them as neighbors. Right. And I would just add to that, in, in addition to the altruistic side um, of of, uh, of of respecting their uh, right to belong, um, there we have so many benefits um, right. um, that come from the beavers. You don't see a lot of that in an urban setting for some of the reasons discussed before. They're often not actually building dams, um, but uh, out outside of cities, you have a huge benefit from that. We, we think of the quintessential waterway as being this fast moving stream, um, but that is not what, um, what, what we had on the landscape a couple hundred years ago when there were hundreds of millions of beavers um, all around. The the beavers keeping water on the land not only creates a habitat for all of these other species, but it also has great ecological benefits. Um, so so it, it, we, 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 shouldn't, um, we shouldn't advocate for them um, uh, just for altruistic reasons. Um, there's a lot for us to gain. Mm -hmm. Corinne is wondering if you want to see the lodge. Uh, do you go to the Voorhees to Black Run Preserve? Is that the best place to do that? Or is there somewhere else? Um, that that is an excellent place. That's uh, that the, the one photo I shared there with yeah. the uh, the circular dam and those lodges. Um, and the three lodges. There's a yeah. trail just a couple minute walk from um, the the the, uh, the trailhead right at the parking lot there um, that you can go out and see that that that's one of the more beautiful, easily accessible sites in the area. What if you want to see one in Philadelphia? What's the best? What would you recommend if you want to see a Philadelphia beaver? Um, Heinz is a, a decent place to go looking for them. Again, this this time of year, um, you would be it would be unlikely to see them in daylight. Mm -hmm. So Kitty answered that um, the beaver by the Wissahickon was right by the Cricket Club golf course. She has video uh, and Billy offered uh, to send it to the Schuylkill Center. Yeah, I'm Mike at SchuylkillCenter.org. Kitty, send me the video. I'd love to share it with, with everybody. We'll figure this out. That, that's very possible all the way up there at, at Flower Town. When we were thinking about Wissahickon, we're thinking about um, right. um, we're in the city and, and Chestnut Hill and such. I have seen signs of beaver activity up there in the Flower Town area. That right. makes sense. And Ellen is saying, thank you. She has seen them in Maine and was totally unaware they were now in our neighborhood. I want to make a quick note about where to yeah. see them. I think this is a fun thing for people to find on their own. Um, and I think it, mm. it's, uh, we can make recommendations, of course. Um, but take a look at what it looks like when a tree gets chewed on by a beaver um, and then look for the stumps and look for those trees. It's it's one of these things where a lot of times when you're looking for some animal, if you're looking for some real subtle, like indication that they're around, beavers are not subtle. You right. know, they're they're really obvious. And so I think it's it, you just have to get that search in it of, that you that you know those stumps are possible to find, and then just keep an eye on the woods along wherever or just not woods. I mean, Penn Treaty Park is is a very yeah. man, you know landscape park. Um, so just like Keep an eye on wherever you're near water. Keep an eye on the trees, yep. um, and you know, don't look for a tree. It's not like sheared off like that, like you would with an axe or a or a chainsaw or something. Look for that like pointed mm -hmm. um, uh, stump, and and you'll find them. Yeah, Suzanne, that's how I found them on the river trail. As I was walking by the Flat Rock Dam and said, "Oh, look at that! Beavers here are here." That's yes, and I think once you, once your eye 
uh, gets trained to look for it, you see yep. one, then you start to, you pay attention right. and you see more. Suzanne, Max wants to know what exactly do beavers eat? Nuts, berries, wood? Well, I think they they seem like they uh, they have special taste in terms of trees. Yeah. Don't you agree? <laughs> um, there's some of the trees that they just completely left alone. Um, but um, the other ones, that, <laughs> I know they've taken down some oaks. That's pretty, that was distressing. Um, yeah, they, they, they primarily are eating um, cambium, which is the, the, yes. the inner layer of the tree bark. Um, so when you see them chopping through a tree, they're not actually eating that inner yeah. wood itself. Yeah. Um, they're, they're eating the bark, but they'll eat, they'll eat lots of different species. Um, fortunately, trees have evolved along with beavers. So uh, most of their favorite yeah. species are also the same kinds of trees that coppice very readily, which means if a beaver chops it off down at the stump, um, within a couple of years, that stump will sprout out additional trees. Mm -hmm. um, willow is a, um, a, is a good example of that. Yes. Yeah. Mike wants to know if there's any trees they won't eat. Suzanne, you notice that there are trees that they seem to leave a bee, but other trees they won't eat? Um, there's some that they won't eat. I, um, there's some plantings down along the uh, canal that they've completely left alone. Um, so, but I can't think of what they are right now. But uh, I know there's more there. of those. He's <laughs> really relative. That or we, Go ahead, Suzanne. We have enough. We have that wire fencing up too. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, but they're pretty clever at getting through if they really want to get something. Yeah. Chris, right. Chris, go ahead. Well, in terms of what they won't eat, it, it, it's really often relative to what other species are available. Um, for instance, they typically will not um, go for the uh, softwoods, your pines and your spruces mm -hmm. and such. Um, it's true. But there are beavers in many places over in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey um, that don't have a lot of alternatives. Um, and they will consume those. Um, if there's not other options. Mm -hmm. But during the summer, when there's lots of greenery around, they're often eating a lot of um, uh, various, various uh, you know, green brush. They're really only chopping down the trees in, in this area for the most part um, later in the year when they're storing up uh, food for the winter. So. Right. Philip has heard of beavers mm -hmm. swimming under the ice and busting through from below. Mm -hmm. Does that sound from, that, that sounds like they would do that if the ice is thin. Yes, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in more northern reaches, um, beavers will actually have to live under the ice for months at a time um, until, yes. the pond, until, uh, until the pond thaws. So. Right, right, right. Oh, and related to that, Max wants to know if beavers hibernate they, or uh, active during the winter. They, they do not hibernate. Um, it, it is dependent on the area. Around here, beavers will be up and about and on land and often ma maintaining similar activity year round. Yeah. Uh, in more Northern climates, they'll have to store up the food in the winter. Um, and then if they are trapped under the ice, they're, they're essentially confined to their lodge and, and the water under the ice mm -hmm. for potentially months at a time. And um, they, they will still be active about 12 hours a day, um, but they'll be solely reliant on the food that they have uh, cached for the winter. William put a link into a Maryland Department of Natural Resources article on beaver as a keystone species providing nature-based restoration. So check that out. Have beavers made it up to up to Schuylkill to Mequon, Spring Mill, and Conshohocken? Yes. Have they gone that far? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's great. Um, unexpected Wildlife Refuge in Newfield, New Jersey, has beavers and beaver lodges. Unexpected Wildlife Refuge. William agrees I don't eat evergreens. Uh, do you ever find beavers in salt or brackish water, asks Allison. Yes, uh, this has been a topic of recent study, um, mainly in the Pacific Northwest, but I have found that it also has great relevance here. Um, as you know, it may know the, the Delaware River is actually tidal all the way up to Trenton, um, and there are um, uh, uh, beavers living in the tidal waters. Um, uh, heading down closer to the Delaware Bay and such that would still be considered considered brackish. Mm -hmm. um, on one related point to that, um, beavers can actually dam um, in tidal estuaries or create estuaries of their own. They, they will um, create a dam that at high tide, the water comes up and over the dam. And then when the tide goes out, 
the water is still contained behind that dam. Um, that's a very unique habitat. Um, like I said, it's primarily been researched in um, Oregon and Washington coast, um, but I have also observed and photographed this um, along the Delaware, specifically at um, Rancocas State Park. There's a, there's a, a number of those tidal dams. Hey, Billy, Philip is asking about the relationship between the Lenape people and beaver. Do you want to uh, offer some thoughts there? Only a couple. I, I don't know a ton about this, but yeah. I, was, um, I mean, except that it, it, it was the tr it was trade between when you look I mean, going back in time quite a bit. I mean, yep. the 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 neck I mean, the way that we that beavers were extirpated locally was the Dutch trading with the Lenape for pelt. Um, but I'll just uh, point out that um, if, for those who know the Poconos, there's a town called Tamaqua, um, and that apparently was named after the Lenape name for beaver. Um, so it was something that that uh, I saw that in a, in a in sort of article about uh, Lenape about the about beavers, and I was like, oh hey, I've been to Tamaqua. But the beavers were extirpated from the Philadelphia region surprisingly early. Like it wasn't in the 1800s, yeah. it was way before. No, I, I was trying to figure this, find this out. I was admittedly I was going by like what I could Google, but um, just so I was seeing comments about by the time the Swedes got here, um, there weren't beavers readily available in the right around Philadelphia, um, or what was what would become Philadelphia, I should say it that way. Exactly. Um, and so I think, and so it 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 so it really quickly. Um, and I think it's, we were talking about before, but it, it, you know, beaver pelts were one of the principal commodities coming out of North America. Right. Um, we think of gold, we think of, you know, other things like that. But I mean, you think of what drove French, um, uh, inter I mean, we're going to the settlement, but French uh, um, activity into like way, way into North America. Um, the classic thinking, classic of it is, is French trappers going up um, waterways and, and basically, you know, trapping beaver and then trading with right. um, Native Americans. So it's, well, we we use the phrase use, we use the phrase fur trade a lot, but it was really beaver almost exclusively at the beginning. From what I understand, yeah. And so yeah. this is um, so on the one hand, like it gave, gives a sense of, and it was it, it gives a sense of their importance um, as an economic in an economic way, but also it gives you a, a sense of how they got wiped out. Um, because you have to have a lot of trapping to wipe. I mean, like they're they're pretty um, they're, they're pretty they, they seem to spread really well. Like right now, we're seeing them spread across the state with seemingly without much problem. Um, there's still some trapping, so it sort of gives you a sense of how how strong the trapping effort was um, and how much economic force there was behind that to wipe them out. Here's a great question from Matt. Um, Suzanne, you would like this one. Do beavers eat any invasive species? So we can <laughs> we can take care of the invasive. <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't seen that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Make your work much easier. That would be, be great. That would be great. <laughs> they, 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 they do eat some. Yeah. They, they do eat some invasive species, but again, it, it's really uh, relative to what else is available around here. Um, you will see them consuming poison ivy. Um, uh, gypsy wort is another one that's very common. That's uh, one of their favorites, especially for um, bringing back to the uh, the young kids. But so, they don't eat lantern flies, I would imagine. No, no. <laughs> strict vegetarians. <laughs> uh, Sandy says, but wouldn't pumas, wolves, etc., have been predators as well? Uh, yes. The answer is Absolutely. yes. I'm not sure what. Go ahead. Yes, yes, those, yes. Would, those would have been predators as well. Yes, on mm -hmm. on beavers back in the day, right? Yes. Okay. So, Suzanne, what was so compelling about your discovery um, that there were beavers that made you want to begin reading up and become sort of a student of beavers? And um, well, go ahead. because I was also part of the conservancy. Yeah. And I had. I had those previous experiences of hearing about beavers either being reintroduced um, in, to, to help with, uh, you know, making the land richer and creating waterways. And I had seen them in the, in the mountains myself, and I thought it was just beautiful to sit and watch them. Yeah. Um, and then to have be part of planting trees here. <laughs> and trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do here? Um, actually, you know, there was a lot of good kidding about it, um, <laughs> right? But, you know, we've, we've done, a, I think we're, we're, we've done a lot of work and uh, 
it's paid off. Yes. And people should look up Roxborough and Mania Conservancy and, and help. Yes. So, because you guys have wonderful uh, opportunities for um, for socially distanced tree plantings, um, right? Yes. Two, on, two on Tuesdays. Um, yes. So check check that out. Two hours. Two hours starts, on Tuesday it, evening. Yeah. yeah. It starts um, up again in March. Good, good. Um, and Chris, yeah. what was so compelling for you about beavers that you stumble upon them and suddenly you've got this incredible website with this great photography going on. So what was, what was this, what, what was the catch for you? Well, in, initially it was just the predictability of this. Here was this somewhat unusual species um, in the area. Um, and uh, the fact that I could come back and they had a predictable schedule and route and um, I could be sure to see them every day, which is uh, unlike, I, I'm interested in nature photography with some other species, but um, beavers are uh, uh, one of the more predictable ones that you'll find. So. Yeah, on your website too, one of your cat, you got like live, love, work, play, right? Yes, uh, yes. And at the end, is it like et cetera or something at the end? Oh, yes, yes. And then that one, click on that one because you've got like beaver going by another animal. It's <laughs> yes, like the, yes. And it's like this community of organisms. It's really great photographs. Right, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, and a big snapping turtle too, I think I saw on there. Yes, yes. Yeah, which is awesome. So thank you. Um, and Billy, what's... Why do you think people are so fascinated by it? There are, there are a number of animals that seem to get people's attention, like coyotes always do. Uh, beaver seems to be getting attention too. So what, we had this funny love-hate relationship with wild animals where we're, we're intrigued that they're with us, but we don't know how to keep them around with us. We're not, we're not good stewards of the relationship. Well, we're also, we also tend to have challenges with, with animals that act like they own the place. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's, it's a, when you think about what gets people so mad about squirrels or so mad about raccoons, um, it's that they treat what we think of as our property as theirs, right? You know, squirrel, like you put out bird seed for birds and the squirrel's like, no, it's my bird seed. And then, you know, with raccoons, you know, they, they go into your trash cans, they go into your roof, they, you know, they're, they're, the, the animals that um, really compete with us for space and use of our space um, tend to uh, get us more excited. Um, and so I think, you know, beavers certainly fit into that category. Um, we're also just, I mean, they're, they're relatively endearing. It's hard to get people so affectionate about snapping turtles as much as I love them. Um, but like beavers, they're, you know, they're, look at Chris's website. They're just, they're, and, and I know that sometimes it can tip too far into like people just thinking of them as like a walking stuffed animal, but um, on top of being a, a really impressive with how they use the landscape and sort of really assertive on the landscape, they're also um, they're also cute, you know. So I think it doesn't doesn't it, it gives you the love part of the love hate, right? Not many other rodents you would use the word endearing with. <laughs> oh, I would, but not everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> not everybody else. That's Bernard Billy Brown. I've been, I've been oh, I'm sorry, bringing, Suzanne. Go ahead. I've been bringing uh, I've been bringing some of the uh, I call them the beaver sticks back to the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, where they've been. The bark is taken off of them and uh, giving them to young children on the block and in the neighborhood. And the kids just love them. Yeah. <laughs> they're, yes, really they're excited about it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice way. It's the next generation of, yeah. you know, to take care of the climate and our waterways. So uh, I think it's, a, it's very attractive to kids as a way of getting them um, involved that's great well thank you suzanne thank you um suzanne is a volunteer of the bicycle coalition and families for safe streets uh and is active with the roxborough Manny Young conservancy which everybody should look up and help volunteer for uh bernard billy brown writes for grid magazine please read it online or on paper and is co-host of the urban wildlife podcast please listen and chris muller is our wonderful nature photographer and creator of the website beaversmatter.org beavers matter Dot org. Chris, thank you. Suzanne, thank you. Bernard, Billy, thank you. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thanks, thank you all. Nice. Thank you. Thank Have you all for night. coming. Next week is um, the Once in Future Forest. So it's the history of Pennsylvania forests. So come back next week. Two weeks, toads. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.